Okay, this is part one. There's going to be several parts. I think about four parts of is it all the same disease? And uh, sort of the reason for this, this is the month of January 2025, and we're talking about um, New Year's resolutions and becoming a low-fat vegan with no oils, and why would you want to do that, and what's the whole rationale behind it? I've alluded to that briefly before. I'm going to go into more detail. And here we're going to start with a joke from the movie Colors. There were two bulls up on a hill. Here's the old bull, bull and there's a young bull. And the young bull says, hey, hey, look down there in the valley. Look at all those cows. Why don't we run down there and have sex with one of them? And the old bull says, why don't we walk down there and have sex with all of them? Okay, so the, the point of the joke is conventional medicine says, here's disease number one, take this pill. Disease number two, take this pill. Disease number three, all the way up through disease number 15, take this pill. It's very routine. Ask any doctor. It's routine for patients in hospitals to be on 10, 20, even 30 pills. Okay, you'd be amazed how many pills people take. Okay, so the point I'm saying is a low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet can treat a whole bunch of diseases. And I'm going to explain that a lot of these diseases are really just manifestations of the same thing. And I'm going to explain, you know, how can you know that confidently and how can you be sure? Because you get all this contradictory information on the Internet from all these phony paleo, keto, carnivores and, and others, you know, high-fat phonies and all this other stuff. So I'm going to just go over some epidemiology and pathophysiology. Here is the border between Arizona and Mexico. Now, in... These populations used to be combined, the Pima Indians and the Mexican uh, Tarahumara. So after 1848, Mexican-American War, the Pima were absorbed into what is now Arizona, and they now eat a westernized American diet, standard American diet. The Tarahumara have stayed in the Sierra Madre Mountains. Sierra means like a saw. Um, Copper Canyon, it's called as well. They, don't, you know, they run around all the time. They grow their food locally. They eat lots of corn, lots of beans and squash and local greens. So, as you would expect from that background, the Pima are fat, sick, and stupid, like typical populations that eat the Western diet, notoriously obese, diabetic, go for amputations, all the standard surgeries, gallbladder surgery, appendicitis, sigmoid resection for diverticulitis, cabbage, coronary artery, bypass, graft. Okay, here's the Tadahumata, and they're world-famous runners. They have a holiday once a year where they run like over 100 miles in two days, and it's every guy in town, not just the fast guy. And a lot of American runners have visited them, like Ruth Hydrich and some ultra-marathoners, to confirm they're real. A guy by the name of Christopher McDougall wrote a book about him. I think it's called Born to Run or something. He's not related to John McDougall as far as I know, but it's a pretty famous book. Okay, now here's the Yanomamo. They live in the, Arizona, uh, the Amazon jungle between Venezuela and Brazil, and they eat a low-fat, primarily plant-based diet. Um, and they only have about 200 milligrams of sodium a day. But the point is they never get hypertensive. The same blood pressure when they're 10 years old as when they're 70. And then there's something called the Simani population, also from South America. And they, had, they got them onto a cardiac CT scanner. And they found they had the lowest calcium of any in their coronaries of any population ever studied. And it goes on and on. You go to China before you know, 1975 when they ate white rice for about 90% of the calories. A billion out of a billion are skinny. Okay. Um, here are the different diets. The American diet, they're screwed. They got more of everything bad, okay? More diabetes, hypertension, MI, stroke, impotence, cancer, everything bad. Okay, you go to East Asia, Japanese, Korea, and China, and the diet was healthy in terms of low in fat, low in protein, a lot of white rice, again, huge amount of percentage of the calories, up to like 90%. But what got them in trouble, especially like Japan, for example, they're eating lots of salt, like 12 to 14 grams per day of sodium. That would drive up their blood pressure. And same thing, they're also smoking like chimneys, a lot of tobacco. Um, so that would cause hypertension and strokes. But they still were reasonably healthy with a low-fat diet. And they also eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, especially vegetables. Okay, here's the Indian diet, people from India. And the thing that gets them in trouble, they eat too much fried food, many of them. And the fried food is increasing the risk of diabetes, uh, coronary artery disease, cognitive impairment. And they eat some sap fat in the form of ghee, the butter, and yogurt, but the fried food seems to be the worst thing as far as I can tell from studying that diet and that population. And here's a low-fat vegan diet. They have the lowest amount of everything, the least amount of all these problems. They don't get hypertension. They don't get diabetes. You know, they have hardly any atherosclerosis, stroke, coronary artery disease, very low rates of cancer. I mean, why wouldn't you want that? You win the game in every way. And the reason is the species-specific optimal human diet and here's what it comes down to. You know, you are here on the map. Hopefully you start getting your act together by 35 years of age or younger. Keep all your arteries open with, and avoid irreversible damage. 
And uh, you got to, you know, a, there's a low-fat vegan diet to avoid, you know, the food toxins. But there's other toxins in the environment, also potentially in the food. That's why you want to eat organic. But if you do that, you got a good chance to live an average of about 90 years of age. Um, if you don't go down that route, this is what happens to like all the patients. I mean, the patients are kind of generic. You know, every public individual thinks of themselves as an individual. But I can tell you, as a doctor, I don't even look at the chart. I mean, I just know somebody tells me, you know, the patient's over 50, over 55. I just assume they're hypertensive, they're diabetic or pre-diabetic. They've got atherosclerosis. They've got coronary artery disease. They probably have a cataract. They're probably cognitively slow. It, it, it's so common that if you're busy, you're not even going to look in the chart. You're just going to make that assumption, and that'd be a safe assumption. You won't you won't get burned by it. You'll be safe with that assumption. Okay, red blood cells, seven microns. You need to know that. That's important to know. Uh, capillary is about five microns in diameter. So what that means is when the red blood cells enter a capillary, they have to bend back on themselves. They have to be flexible, deformable is often the used medical word. The red blood cells can be stuck together by bridging molecules. The, bridging mo the red blood cells have a negative charge on their outer surface called the zeta potential. A bridging molecule will have a positive charge and it'll stick them together. And then you're now, instead of pushing individual red blood cells that are flexible through a capillary, you're pushing a bunch of them stuck together. So pressure has to go up. The reason for a blood pressure is to get blood to the top of your brain, your cerebral cortex. Okay? If you're pumping normal blood, it's like water. You can pump it very easily at a low pressure. If you're pumping thick blood, like a milkshake, you have to pump at a higher pressure. And then sodium vasoconstricts those arteries. So does uric acid from high fructose corn syrup, for example. It'll vasoconstrict the arteries. Now you're having to pump thick blood, a milkshake, through a constricted, narrowed system. Pressure will have to go up. The thicker the blood, blood thickness is called blood viscosity. Okay, this is a scene from the movie Game Changers about vegan diet and athletes. And normal blood is translucent, the plasma. You have it sedimenting here after they put it in a centrifuge with the red blood cells at the bottom. Hematocrit's about 44%. Uh, white blood cell and platelets are called the buffy coat in the middle. That's a real small amount, like less than 1%. Over 99% of the cells in the blood are red blood cells. Okay, plasma cell is translucent. You can see through it. But after a high-fat meal, the plasma becomes quite opaque because of all the fat in the blood. And you no longer can see through it so well and you no longer transmit oxygen to the tissue so well. So we talked about bridging molecules. I'll show you a better example of that. Okay, here's the zeta potential, meaning the negative charge on the outer surface of the red blood cell. Sticking up from its plasma membrane are all these little uh, glycoproteins. They're called sugar-coated proteins, all right? And they give it a negative charge. That is the zeta potential. Now, if you have a molecule with a positive charge on its outer surface and it's big enough in size, it'll overcome the zeta potential of two adjacent red blood cells and stick them together. So here's an IgM antibody, like from the acute phase of response to an infection. And those can cause the red blood cells to stick together. That's why acute infections can cause thrombosis. Like you get pancreatitis, you can thrombose the pancreatic, uh, the splenic vein, which runs right along the surface of the pancreas. You get pyelonephritis infection of the kidney. You can thrombose the main renal vein. Okay, here is the effect of LDL cholesterol. Uh, the higher the LDL cholesterol, the more red blood cells are stuck together. LDL cholesterol is a bridging molecule. It'll stick red blood cells together, so that'll increase the blood viscosity when the red blood cells are stuck together. So again, here's what a bridging molecule does. It overcomes the zeta potential. Here's two red blood cells, negative charge on their outer surface. Bridging molecule, positive charge on its outer surface, overcomes the zeta potential, sticks the red blood cells together like this. Uh, IgM antibodies are a uh, bridging molecule. LDL cholesterol is a bridging molecule. Fibrinogen is a bridging molecule. That is the clotting protein in the blood. And fibrinogen gets activated, remember, by bacterial endotoxins, LPS and LTA. So if you've got leaky gut, it's going to activate your fibrinogen, cause it to become more prothrombotic, stick everything together. Okay, if you have high uric acid, like from eating a lot of meat or from eating um, a lot of high fructose corn syrup, that will also function as a bridging molecule to stick the red blood cells together. So here's your red blood cell, and it'll be stuck together. So you don't want that. Psychological stress also has a similar effect. Psychological stress will make the blood more prothrombotic. You know, it'll activate uh, your platelets a bit. You'll be more prothrombotic. It'll inhibit your, uh, it'll cause more vasoconstriction, for example. High dietary sodium causes more platelet activation. It's prothrombotic. That artificial sweetener, xylitol, is prothrombotic um, and activates platelets. Uh, being dehydrated makes your blood a little more prone to clotting. All right, well, anyways. It's good to know all this stuff. Being overloaded in iron, most American men are overloaded in iron by the time they're 25. Most uh, women 
become iron overloaded, you know, after when they're by the time they're about 60 because they're no longer menstruating. So the point I'm making is there's a whole bunch of things that push you towards clotting. And the reason I say clotting and I emphasize that is that's what atherosclerosis is. Atherosclerosis is a blood clot. You need to know that. Those are like fundamental things you need to know. And by the way, they don't teach this stuff in medical school. As basic and simple as all the stuff I'm talking about here, it's not taught in med school. But if you want to understand the human body, it's real helpful to know this stuff. Okay, here's peak lipemia. This is the work of Peter Quo, cardiologist in Pennsylvania in the 1950s, and he found that if you feed patients saturated fat and then check their blood lipids every 30 minutes, you will find that at peak lipemia, the highest level of fat in the blood, between, let's say, about three to you know, eight hours, you will get more and more of the red blood cells sticking together, more rouleau formation. Rouleau means stack of coins in French, okay? It's also called blood sludge is another way to say it, essentially the same thing. Okay, and then they thought, oh, by the 1960s, well, unsaturated fat's going to be better, you know, like the omega-6 cooking oil. So they tried it with omega-6 cooking oils in the 1960s, and Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosamond did work on this, and what they found was even worse. The uh, omega-6 cooking oils caused even more stickiness of the blood, sticking the red blood cells together, overcoming the zeta potential, causing more blood sludge. There's a nice video on the Internet. It's at the Dr. McDougall YouTube channel. Just type in high-fat meal blood sludge, and it's only about 50 seconds long. It's worth seeing that. Um, okay, so here's what happens with hypertension. With hypertension, the blood comes up under high pressure. This is the bifurcation of the carotid. So you have internal carotid going up to your brain and then to your face will be the little branch vessels coming off the external carotid. But here's the big bifurcation. Common carotid comes up in your neck and right in your upper neck, about where your skull, your jaw meets your uh, neck, so to speak, this is where the bifurcation is. Okay, a little lower than that. The blood hits the bifurcation, bounces off of there. So Blood flow that is chaotic is called turbulent flow. When it's going backwards, that's called uh, eddy current or retrograde eddy current. So when there's an excessive amount of turbulent flow and an excessive amount of eddy current, the arterial lining senses that as an injury and it will shed its antithrombotic superficial covering, its antithrombotic glycocalyx. Then deeper within that uh, plasma membrane on outer surface, you'll have what are called prothrombotic molecules, adhesion molecules, vascular cell adhesion factor. And they're sitting right here, and they now become exposed because of all this abnormal blood flow. And then the red blood cells will stick to them, okay? They're prothrombotic, and the white blood cells stick to them too. So here's atherosclerosis. It's a blood clot, and there's a characteristic location. It forms on the far wall, far relative to the median divider. And you only got one big bifurcation in your neck, the bifurcation of the common carotid. In your heart, you got tons and tons of little bifurcations, and, you know, many of them just unnamed. But this is the spot where atherosclerosis uh, initiates, where it begins. What happens is the clot forms on the surface of the endothelium, and then endothelial precursor cells come and they cover it up. That's how it becomes subendothelial. That's important to know because you'll hear other things about that. Okay, here's just a quick picture of leaky gut. And, and also, why am I showing you this? What's the point? How does this all make sense? Because what I'm saying is it's the same diet, a high-fat diet, that causes all this stuff. All right, so here's normal gut. Dietary fiber. You only have fiber in plants, none in animal foods. It's taken up by the good bacteria. They convert it to short-chain fatty acids like butyrate, 4-carbon butyrate. The 4-carbon butyrate is taken up by the intestinal lining cells, the enterocytes, and it's used to make TJs, tight junctions. These tight junctions prevent anything abnormal from getting across the red blood cells, okay? Now, if you don't have the f dietary fiber, then you can't make your tight junctions. And now bacterial endotoxins like LPS, lipopolysaccharide from gram-negative bacteria, or LTA, lipotychoic acid from gram-positive bacteria, they will get across this gut lining, and then some of them will get into the blood, and they become prothrombotic. They, they cause the blood to pre, predispose to clot. All of these things are like, I don't know, 20-something things, more than that, are things that cause leaky gut. So there are chemicals that will predispose to leaky gut. You want to avoid all of them. But again, what I, the point I'm showing is there's multiple mechanisms here this leaky gut, these atherogenic foods, they're all driving towards uh, plugging up arteries and causing the blood to clot and making people fat, sick, and stupid. Okay, so here's what I show. With the leaky gut, the gram-negative bacteria, G-negative goes to LPS, lipopolysaccharide, gram-positive bacteria, producing lipotychoic acid, excessive free iron accumulating. The reason iron accumulates is because they iron fortify foods, which is a really bad, unhealthy, stupid thing to do. But they do that, plus the meat has a lot of iron. And the iron, when it gets in, present in large amounts of the blood, it ferrous redox cycles, means it goes back and forth between Fe2 plus Fe3 plus Fe2 plus Fe3 plus. And electrons can be given off that will lead to reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress. The key point here with regard to the fibrinogen is it changes from being alpha helix, 
to flattening out to become what's called a beta pleated sheet. So this is secondary protein structure, and the beta pleated sheets will stack up upon themselves. It's hard to stack a bunch of slinkies, but it's easy to stack a bunch of playing cards that are flat. And then they bind to each other, and as the bigger a molecule is in aqueous solution, the more likely it is to precipitate out. So they precipitate out a solution. That means they form a blood clot. So leaky gut uh, predisposes to blood clot formation. That's not good. And this is a special type of blood clot formation because it went from being alpha helix and a secondary protein structure, the fibrinogen molecule up here, that it now becomes a beta pleated sheet shape, and that predisposes to aggregation, stacking, and clotting. Okay, that's called amyloid clotting when the secondary protein structure changes from fibrinogen to uh, fibrinogen alpha helix to beta pleated sheet. Okay, and that's the end of part one. I hope that was helpful. We'll go through the other parts soon.